Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, I've had the pleasure um, of interviewing a bunch of different people on COVID-19. I've interviewed politicians. I've interviewed emergency preparedness people. I've interviewed infectious doctors. I've interviewed people uh, pro um, a lot of the lockdowns, uh, and I've interviewed a couple of people that have been against uh, the lockdowns. Roman Barber, who is the NPP in York Center, uh, was removed from the Provincial Caucus, the Provincial Progressive Conservative Caucus, uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, because he opposed Doug Ford's government's lockdown and uh, the restrictions associated with COVID-19. So I thought I'd check in with him and find out how he's doing and, and what uh, his rationale was. Um, MPP Roman Barber, how are you? Welcome to our show. Good evening, Brian. Good to be with you. So tell me, you wrote a letter uh, that was uh, reasonably uh, um, negative toward what you thought the lockdown uh, procedures were. Why'd you write that letter? Look, I made the decision to speak out after speaking with hundreds of constituents and people across Ontario. Uh, the lockdown is causing more harm than good. So I wrote about the impacts of the lockdown on health, mental health, the increase in overdoses, uh, suicidal thoughts, and the economic and, and socioeconomic toll on Ontarians, all of which I submit should be factored into our decision-making. So it's important to have a fair and open discussion, not just about the risk of the virus, but the catastrophic toll of the lockdown as well. And uh, I was told that you raised some of these concerns in caucus um, and they weren't heard, is that true? Um, I, I've been fortunate to, to be able to have a lot of good conversations with a lot of folks, including the premier. Um, unfortunately, uh, my concerns were not, um, I, I, I guess the, the focus at all times was only on COVID. And that's not a bad thing because necessarily because COVID is a real virus and it could be very, very dangerous to select populations, particularly folks that live in group homes, more than 80% of all those that passed away from COVID tragically uh, were living in group homes. Uh, and those over the age of 80 with pre-existing conditions. However, it's also important to consider what, if any, toll there is on the lockdown, uh, specifically the effect on our healthcare, on our mental health, on our uh, employment, and all sorts of factors that uh, are influenced by social isolation. So I was hoping that there would be more conversation about that. And I think that since my letter, we've been having that conversation. And uh, did you know that if you wrote the letter, uh, you were gonna be removed from caucus? I don't propose to dwell on politics. I'm content with my decision. Um, I'm proud of my decision because you notice that in the last three weeks, the tone uh, and the narrative on COVID and COVID response has completely changed. Uh, what I set out to accomplish is to spark a conversation about the catastrophe that the lockdown is. And I submit respectfully that I was able to accomplish that. And I wanted to provide a lot more cover and courage for professionals to speak out about what they're seeing that results from the lockdown. And I, I think that thankfully, uh, we're now in position today where the Minister of Education has announced the reopening of Ontario schools. This is despite the fact that uh, the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Health said that we need the ICU number to go to half of what it is today, that we need cases to go below a thousand. None of those have happened, but I'm very, very happy that we are now at a point where we're gonna stop imposing this remarkable toll on Ontario's children and they're gonna go back to school where they belong. So I guess I would have thought if you were in cabinet, cabinet solidarity would suggest that you had to sort of toe the government line, but you were not in cabinet, right? Uh, I, I was not in cabinet. I'm chair of uh, parliament's justice committee. Uh, I guess still will be until parliament resumes. But uh, no, uh, party discipline applies to both cabinet members and caucus members. But I'm of the view that even though I'm, I'm, I'm loyal to my party and I'm uh, loyal to, to my friends and, and my caucus, my first and foremost duty is that to my constituents, the people that elected me. And in the last several weeks leading to my letter, I've heard hundreds from hundreds of people that describe the toll that the lockdown is taking, particularly on their children. Uh, 
I've heard from so many folks telling me that they don't recognize their children, that their children have anxiety, that their children have depression. In the weeks leading to my letter, I've heard of multiple suicide attempts. I've heard of remarkably sad stories from all over the province. And I decided that even though um, there is party discipline, I represent my constituents first, they can't be ahead of the party. We're chatting tonight with Roman Barber. He is the MPP for York Centre. He now sits as an independent because uh, in the last month, uh, Premier Doug Ford removed him from the Pro Progressive Conservative Caucus because he came out against the province's uh, um, restrictions associated with COVID-19 and the lockdown. We're gonna take a break for some messages and come back more with, uh, with MPP uh, Barber in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're talking about COVID-19 restrictions tonight with MPP Roman Baber. I pronounced his name wrong as Barber. I apologize as Baber. There's no R uh, in uh, in his name. Um, I guess I just, uh, I'm, I'm, because of COVID restrictions, I'm desperate to get a Barber haircut. And so I think that that was a Freudian slip or something like that. I apologize, sir. Um, uh, Roman Baber. Don't worry, Brian. That's not unusual. They typically refer, me, refer to me as the guy, get off my lawn, so. Don't Roman worry. Baber is the MPP for York Centre. Uh, he uh, um, was first elected uh, in the last election as a progressive conservative, um, though I've been told you've been a progressive conservative uh, for a long period of time. I've been told you've been very involved in provincial and uh, federal as well as municipal politics. I'm not sure if that's uh, all true, but it'd be interesting to hear uh, what you have to say on that. Uh, and then you've got some strong opinions. And, and it's interesting, you take a look at uh, Mr. Baber's background. He was actually born in the Soviet Union, immigrated to Israel, when he was eight years old, um, spent uh, some time in Israel and then immigrated to Canada when he was 15. So he's, uh, he's had experiences of, of several different countries and uh, obviously as a youth, uh, uh, pol different political systems, uh, which is kind of interesting. But you've taken probably the strongest uh, stance of your career against uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, MPP Baber, Canada on a per capita basis is doing something like five times better than the United States on both uh, infections and mortality. And a lot of people think that's because the United States, particularly the Southern United States opened up uh, their restrictions too early. Don't you think that you risk increasing um, if people followed your policies, a far higher infection rate and a lot more deaths? Brian, what we're seeing is that lockdown has no effect on the metrics that actually matter. It's not about the number of cases. The metrics that matter are people in ICU and God forbid deaths. And there is no proportional connection between cases and ICU hospitalizations and deaths. Let me give you an example. God forbid tomorrow we can go out and 100,000 young adults uh, in Ontario will get COVID and you will not see any increase in hospitalization. Most of them will survive, almost all of them statistically will survive it okay. However, if God forbid you got 200 seniors in a long-term care getting COVID, you'll have 100 uh, people dead from COVID. So it's not about how many people get COVID, it's who gets COVID. So what I've been arguing is that what we need to do is that we need to protect the most vulnerable. We need to focus on where the problem is, which is primarily in long-term care and retirement homes and not imprison 15 million Ontarians instead that are at a, statistically are at a very low risk of COVID. Now, Florida, conversely, is actually doing pretty well these days, uh, but more importantly, there are jurisdictions around the world that have not followed this model, and they're also comparatively okay. In Asia, the approach to, to COVID is different. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, even Korea to some extent, have a somewhat liberal uh, policy, but for pub basic public health mitigations. Uh, countries in Eastern Europe have also taken a different approach. Uh, Russia, and of course the Swedish model is something that's worth looking at. And by the way, when you look at the Swedish model, the only, the primary differences in terms of deaths are deaths in nursing homes, in long-term care homes, which they had a lot of in the beginning. So again, the, the, the point is, let's look at the data objectively Cases are meaningless because it's not about how many cases, it's about who gets those cases, which is why we need to protect long-term care. But isn't the issue that uh, if you get community spread and you get cases, even in young people, that they're gonna pass it on to their parents, to their grandparents. And so therefore you've 
um, made it far more difficult to contain the virus. So there's no question that there's going to be community spread and, and you're not going to be able to stop it unless you remain in hard lockdown forever. As soon as you remove the lockdown, cases will immediately spike back. And we, we can talk about the ultimate exit strategy and why I believe that a vaccine, even though I'm going to take the vaccine, is not a viable exit strategy. You will be back in lockdown in no time. What you need to do is you need to have a greater appreciation. We, we need to come, we need to be fair with respect to the narrative. And again, when it comes to older generations, we have now seen that primarily more than, again, more than 80% of those that passed away under 6,000 people passed away in Ontario from COVID approximately since the beginning of this pandemic, more than 4,800 of them are in group homes. And this is unfortunately where you have folks that are very, very vulnerable. Typically you don't go into a long-term care facility unless you are nearing end of life. And that's not to say that not every life is valuable. I value those lives incredibly. What I'm saying is that the government should actually do what the government failed to do and erect the and fortify the iron ring that they've committed to do that they failed to do, be it by infection protocol and control. We still don't have good infection control long-term care, be it by the fact that we still have agency workers and temporary workers working in more or one homes, which is completely unacceptable. But, but beyond that, Brian, I would invite your listeners to think about also the lives that are taken by virtue of COVID, and those are also lives. And those are lives that affect the bulk of the population as well. Let me give you an example. In my letter, in my letter I cited an oncologist from Princess Margaret Hospital who says that our cancer screenings are barely up back to the 60% level. We're down by 40% in terms of screenings. And cancer is not gone. In fact, I had an ER physician write to me a couple of days ago. Cancer is still there. It's just that we diagnose it a lot later, we miss it, and at that point, it may be too late. So we have- um, And that's why, that's because people are, are reticent to go to hospitals because they're afraid they're gonna catch COVID? That's one reason, we're, we're discouraging people from seeing. Second of all, we have a paralysis throughout the healthcare system because of COVID mitigation. Doctors are seeing less patients in person. You, you cannot get, it's very, very difficult to get an in-person appointment today, and so people are discouraged from coming. Um, remote healthcare doesn't work, just like is not ideal, just like remote education. And we have considerable shortage of healthcare resources because the bulk of them are tied in for COVID preparedness. We have COVID protocols that are rationing healthcare, denying Ontarians healthcare. And in my respectful submission, that needs to end. Ontarians want their healthcare back. So what would you do? Uh, Sweden, you say, uh, is an example. Uh, they effectively um, you know, allowed uh, um, herd immunity to uh, be created. And for a couple of months, lots of people were saying it was working. And then uh, in the fall, uh, their infection rate was so high, their mortality was so high that the rest of Scandinavia closed the borders to Sweden. I'm not saying that we should go with a Swedish model. That's not what I said. I said that there are alternatives around the world, like Asia, like some countries in Eastern Europe, and like Sweden. However, um, I proposed a four point plan. Number one, throw the resources at where the problem is, which is long-term care, retirement home, protect them. No number question, I can agree with that. Okay, number two. Yeah, so once you do that, and once you vaccinate those folks in the red zones, and I understand that most of them are, all, if not all of them, have already been vaccinated. Those are long-term care staffers and residents in the red zones. That takes a great amount of risk off the table. So, so one is protect and throw all your resources at long-term care. Two, build hospital capacity if you actually need hospital capacity. I don't believe that capacity is an issue. I'm relying on numbers given to me by the Ministry of Health. But if capacity is an issue, then build additional capacity like, like we built at, uh, at Joseph Brandt Hospital uh, where we built a beautiful tent uh, for COVID patients, a, a field tent. It's sitting empty. But if we need more, fine, let's build more. And, and number three, Let's be honest about the risk of the virus. Let's reassess it. This is not the catastrophe that we feared in March and April. We need to reassess our response on the basis of what we learned about the virus. And we learned quite a bit about the virus. We haven't adjusted their response. And we should most definitely stop scaring children who are developing anxiety about this, but not a single child died from, from the virus in the province of Ontario. And number four, we need to lift the lockdown. And lift the lockdown means back to school, back to work. What that looks like, we can discuss. But back to school, back to work, because 
not being at school, not being at work is worse for the healthcare of Ontarians than COVID at large. But having said all of that, I know a lot of your listeners are thinking that I'm dismissing COVID or I'm dismissing human life. On the contrary, I'm advocating for human life. I'm advocating for life that is being prejudiced, that's being compromised by COVID response, whether it's the suicide or the overdoses. You know, City of Toronto came out with, with its 2019 statistics, drug overdoses up 67% from 2019. A, a remarkable number, opioid overdoses, paramedic calls on suspected opioid overdoses in the city of Toronto almost doubled. They're 90% up. These numbers are staggering. I, I, I dread seeing the provincial numbers. We should think about those lives as well and what social isolation and lack of employment and lack of health care is doing to people and the repercussions on their, on their lives. We so do you think that uh, Premier Doug Ford is not paying attention to mental health, to addiction, to uh, people's unemployment, etc.? Regretfully, that, that is what we're seeing. We're seeing that not just from Doug Ford, up until a couple of weeks ago, and specifically up until my letter uh, on January the 15th, there's been almost no discussion on the adverse effects of lockdown. However, we're now seeing a, a, the narrative changing, the tone is changing, and we have been seeing a good amount of stories in the last couple of weeks on the adverse effects of the lockdown, whether it's me, um, mental health of young adults and children, we saw the pediatricians come out and saying, this is not healthy for children, the Pedi Pediatricians Alliance. We saw a hundred doctors write a letter, a uh, hundred Canadian doctors write a letter to the premiers yesterday saying kids need to be, it's safer for kids to be at school because they're being harmed at home. We saw an article in the Toronto Star about more baby injuries that regretfully are stemming from folks being at their wits end. We're, we're seeing, uh, I'm sorry if I already said eating disorders, um, we're, we're seeing, all of a sudden, folks started understanding that it's okay to speak about something other than COVID, that it's okay to speak about mental health, it's okay to speak about cancer, it's okay to speak about overdose, because those are also healthcare conditions that people are dying, and we need to think about those people as well, and we need to balance. Okay, so when you raise these concerns in caucus, or you raise them with uh, Premier Ford, or you raise them with the Chief Medical Officer of Ontario, what do they say? Do they dismiss your concerns or do they say, yes. oh, you're not paying attention to the most important problem, which is COVID? I think there's a, I, I would venture to say, and I say that respectfully to everyone, that a lot of what we're seeing is a political exercise. A political exercise where we have this politically correct culture, this, this COVID dogma that is fortified by cancel culture where if you dare to question COVID response, you suffer consequences, just like I did with my with removal from caucus. There is no speaking, until recently, there was no conversation allowed about COVID. There's, there's uh, anti-mask uh, rallies, uh, Dundas Square all the time. There's lots of people that are uh, uh, questioning uh, COVID, questioning uh, masks, questioning social distancing, uh, questioning the lockdowns. And look at the derisive attitude that they're getting. People are protesting their right to open their business or people are protesting their right to see grandma in a long-term care center and we call them derogatory terms. And we invite the police to, to potentially arrest demonstrators outdoors, even though there is no transmission outdoors. Meanwhile, we did not arrest any Navalny uh, demonstrators uh, a week ago that were protesting at St. Clair. We certainly do not arrest people that congregate inside of Costco where indoors the risk of transmission is significantly higher, but a lady standing outside with a sign on Dundas Square, that's a hazard to public health, according to John Tory. So no, there is no dissent allowed. And, and frankly, I think it's incumbent on us. You mentioned that I'm from the Soviet Union. Questioning government is our democratic right, and that includes questioning the experts. And for every COVID expert that we have at public health, and, and may I remind you, our public health leadership are politicians, in addition to the fact that public health are typically ideologically driven. That's why you go into public health. So it's okay to question officials. It's okay to ask for a second medical opinion. And it's okay to weigh the harm. Just like in medicine, we wouldn't administer cure if the cure was worse than the disease. In, in politics, we gotta ask the same thing as well. Is the medicine killing the patient? And we need to weigh all things equally. So no, there has no been conversation allowed, and now it's finally allowed.
Okay, so let's 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 go through some things that uh, I've heard about you, um, and I think a lot of them are wrong. So let me just uh, check. So the first is you are not a COVID uh, disbeliever. You don't deny that COVID is a virus and and and, and exists, correct? COVID is a very real virus. So COVID is a is a strain of Corona virus. Um, corona has existed for my understanding is close to a millennia. Um, COVID is unique in that unlike most coronas, and there's multiple types of coronas, RNA viruses, it tends to attack those that are most vulnerable and instigate effluent pneumonia, a very common cause of death among the elderly. COVID has some exceptions in that it often, it, it may attack various parts of the body, it may attack the lung, may attack the, the brain, may attack cardio. And finally, it has one interesting scientific exception, which is for some reason, and that is the one exception, it is somewhat risky to folks with diabetes. And, and the jury is still out on that. So no, COVID is very real. And we need to think about COVID response, but our, respond, but our response is considerably exaggerated. It's not based in science and it fails to account for the adverse effects of the response. Okay, second, um, some people have said that you're an anti-masker. You're not an anti-masker. My, my, my submission with respect to physical distancing, masks, surfaces, outdoor, indoor, is that there has been no conversation whatsoever about any of those elements. I don't think that public health knows their position on masks. In April, all of the public health leadership in Canada and this province were anti-maskers. Same with Maine. It's until then, first of all, they just wanted this in healthcare settings. Then they said, okay, healthcare settings and long-term care. Then they said, let's go only indoors when you can't physically distance. Then they said indoors all the time, even if you can physically distance. And as recently, just before my exodus from caucus, there was a proposal that we should be wearing masks outdoors. Even though by public self's own admission, there's almost no transmission outdoors. So what I want to do is I want to know how we came about this, this process within a very short amount of time, without lengthy, without any controlled studies, how the science evolved. And it's okay to question science. That's what science is. It's can you achieve it once and replicate it again and show me that it works. We haven't had any controlled studies. In fact, there have been studies pointing the opposite. Physical distancing. I want to talk about physical distancing. It we know that the virus is airborne, right? Because for, for a very long time, we thought that it's droplets. We now learn more and more that it's in the air. So it could even pass through air conditioning in a restaurant. We've actually seen that quite early. And, and, and more and more health authorities around the world are updating their understanding of the virus and saying it's airborne. So if the virus is airborne, then why do we need to physically distance? It makes no difference. Now, I, I might be wrong, but Brian, I'm entitled to be wrong. Since when are we not entitled to be wrong? And I just asked a reasonable question. Public health cannot agree on itself with itself on masks. Airborne transmission is not consistent with physical distancing. All right, well, Roman might be wrong. So let's have that conversation. We haven't had any conversation and there's absolutely no reason why legislators, doctors and ordinary citizens cannot question government with respect to some of the extraordinary things the government has been engaging in. And so I'm if you ask uh, public health uh, those two questions about the efficacy of a mask or the efficacy of physical distancing, when your government, when your prior government imposed it, um, what do they say? Oh, well, it's what we accept or, or we've got scientific proof or, or what? What do they say? I have never received a satisfactory answer from public health, ever. And I question them repeatedly. I'm a litigator. Uh, I cross-examined more than, I, I'm guessing, between 1,000 and 1,500 witnesses in my life. And I have never received a satisfactory response from public health, except for one occasion. When I questioned uh, a public health doctor recently about the vaccine. And for the record, I will take the vaccine. But... I asked, what is the efficacy? So what is the level of threshold of immunity that public health is looking for? 
and they're now public and they're saying, we're looking for at least 70% vaccination. And that's impossible because uh, uh, children under 18 are not eligible for, for the vaccine. Women that are pregnant or are contemplating pregnancy, it's not recommended that they take it. And same with folks with uh, protein allergies. So you already take 20, 25% of the population off the table. When you add that to the 10% of Canadians that refuse to take it and the 30% of Canadians that are unsure about taking it, you can never reach the threshold of immunity. That's number one. Number two, vaccine development, production and distribution is very complex. We prepare for the flu season a year in advance. So to have distribution, mass distribution of, of this vaccine is, going, is, is a very difficult exercise as we're seeing right now. Production and distribution are naturally gonna be delayed. And number three, and this is most important, why the vaccine is not an exit strategy, which means that we cannot stay in lockdown forever and wait for a vaccine. Because Corona mutates. There are variants all the time. And we're already seeing a UK variant, a South African variant. Moderna came out and said, and Pfizer said, yeah, we're gonna cover the UK variant. But the South African variant is not going to be covered by the current vaccine formula. And Moderna came out in mid-January and said, our vaccine is only good for a year. So we're going to be in this, again, we're always gonna be playing catch up with what we think the formula ought to be for the following COVID season. But aren't we uh, doing that with the flu where we have to update the vaccine, guess at what uh, the variant's gonna be. We take a look at what's happening in, in uh, the Southern hemisphere. We use that to uh, figure out what our vaccine's gonna be. And, and we're, you know, we're not vaccinating 70% of the population, but we're vaccinating a lot of people with the flu vaccine. And uh, in regards Except to- uh, our Sure, but our approach to COVID is completely different. Yes, you, you are right. We're, we're doing the same thing with, we're doing the same thing with, with the flu. But our approach to COVID is to lock all of us down at home when cases spike. We certainly don't do that with the flu. I'm saying that what, what we- well, Maybe we should. The flu supposedly has been the, 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 the least infectious and, uh, and, uh, and, and cost of uh, mortality this year that it's ever been. And so for whatever yeah. reason, the stuff that we were doing for public health actually uh, created a real win against this year's flu. If, if, if public health had this win against the flu, they would have the same win against COVID. We have the press secretary to the Minister of Health coming out and saying, we only had 14 cases of flu this year in Ontario. This was two weeks ago. Can you imagine we have 14 million people and this season we only had one case of the flu? It's remarkable. We, co we, ki we cure the common flu, but we didn't cure drug overdose and we didn't cure cancer and we didn't cure heart disease. And they are running rampant as we're trying to lock down 15 million healthy people instead of protecting folks in LTC. The point is the vaccine is not gonna get us out once we're out of lockdown, cases are going to spike again. We need to reassess our response. So on the vaccine, uh, two points. My understanding is that uh, the way the clinical trials are done is that initially you do it on um, adults. Um, uh, you uh, typically will exclude uh, people under the eight age of 18 pediatrics and uh, and then uh, what's typical in almost every clinical trial of any kind of uh, vaccine or pharmaceutical is you'll exclude uh, pregnant females. Um, but then after you get the, uh, the, the vaccine or the pharmaceutical approved, you'll go back and do pediatric studies and studies on, uh, on adult females. And my understanding is that that's exactly what's happening uh, as of now. Uh, and so I think you're correct that the recommendation is against pediatric use and pregnant females uh, right now because they weren't studied. Um, uh, just like people that had uh, uh, prior allergic reactions to drugs weren't studied and were excluded from uh, the trials. But now um, people are going on doing, which would be typical, uh, the pediatric studies, the pregnant uh, female studies, et cetera. So that the vaccine will be studied and may or may not be available uh, and recommended to people in the future. So I think that is sort of the, the typical ways that uh, things are done. Um, as far as the amount of vaccines, no question it's gonna be difficult to, uh, to uh, manufacture it and distribute it. But frankly, Canada has been criticized internationally because um, Canada has actually contracted to buy um, five times as many vaccines as our population. Uh, we are the most over um, contracted for vaccinated country in the world. That said, uh, regrettably, we're not getting the vaccine shipped to us as quickly as some other countries are. So it's a challenge in both, you know, how, whether you bet with the right horse and get the uh, company that gets approved uh, um, uh, the earliest as one of your uh, contracting manufacturers or whether you 
um, supply and get contracted uh, a lot more product than you need. Uh, anyway, I think that- uh, vaccine... may, But may I respond to that very quickly? Brian, having, having said all of that, let's assume best case scenario, a year, half a year to a year from now, there is, there is a decent level of vaccination. First of all, we can survive another half a year to a year. Second of all, you're still not counting the adverse effect. You're not counting the change in suicides. You're not counting the change in cancers. You're not counting the change in overdoses and so on and so forth. And I submit to you that you can't make these decisions in a vacuum of what the effect of the lockdown is. And finally, I say to you, fine, let's say everyone's vaccinated, but the vaccine is only good for a year. Now we need to wait another year and catch up and, and, and get another vaccine. And until then we're gonna be locked down again. Surely that's not viable, Brian. So Roman, what's your solution? Again, let's focus on long-term care and retirement homes where the problem is that eliminates more than 80% of your problem. Number two, build hospital capacity if you need it. Number three, be honest about your assessment with the virus. And number four, lift the lockdown. Let people go back to work. Let kids go back to school. We have to do it for our mental health and for our health. So it's interesting. Um, you know, I would agree with, uh, with number one, two, and three, I think. Uh, I think that... Uh, based on the analysis uh, and the interviews that I've done, uh, that uh, I agree that uh, we have not done a good job with long-term care. And I think uh, when we do the post audit, uh, it's gonna be one of the biggest tragedies in Canadian history. Uh, okay. And uh, I have interviewed people that uh, talked about a judicial inquiry that the provincial government of Ontario did after SARS that identified at that point in time that our, uh, our biggest area of weakness was long-term care, came out with a bunch of different recommendations and people have suggested they weren't followed if not frankly, even forgotten. And, uh, and so long-term care is unquestionably an issue that we haven't uh, addressed uh, um, well, would be a uh, understatement uh, like crazy. Um, I do think that, uh, that masks and social distancing um, work. And I've been told by uh, um, anti-infection uh, and infection experts uh, that uh, frankly, uh, if everyone was wearing a mask um, and everyone was six feet apart, and or all interactions took place outside, which is a point that you made, um, that uh, it would be as effective as a vaccine. Um, uh, and that's how powerful that was. And I think if you take a look at Japan, a lot of the, the reports that have been done on Japan and why Japan was so successful is because culturally, um, Japan just wore masks all the time. And, uh, and they did it because of smog and subways and in, in the cities, et cetera. So cultural acceptance in Hong Kong, China, Japan of mask wearing uh, all the time uh, was, uh, was far more prevalent. Um, I think they also, uh, you know, you talk about uh, uh, lockdowns. What they did is far more stringent lockdowns in China, South Korea, Japan, um, but then they lifted them. And so there was very stringent lockdowns whenever there was a uh, outbreak. Um, you know, we had, I think it was 15 million people that were effectively locked down in, uh, in uh, February, March in Wuhan, uh, but that was lifted. Um, and so um, one of the things that the, uh, the epidemic experts and emergency preparedness experts uh, that I've interviewed have said is that we've not taken the lockdowns far enough such that they end up being less effective and we put them on too long such that people get fatigue. And so I think that is a challenge. On your final point, I have long argued that we need to have a different kind of, of uh, restrictions, that what we should have done is uh, allowed stores to stay open, allowed restaurants to stay open, but at reduced capacity. Because I frankly think that some of the restaurants spent a lot of money, put in plexiglass, put in health standards, uh, the waiters and waitresses wore masks, um, and they were doing a, a good job, and they shouldn't have been uh, so unfairly um, restricted in their business by closing them down completely. And what we've done is we've forced too many people to leave all the local stores and the local restaurants and congregate in Costco and the big boxes, uh, which uh, has meant that there's more people there and we're too close together. Anyway, what do you think is going to happen? You've made your letter. You've been kicked out of caucus. People are starting to question things now. What do you think is the next step? What's going to happen? I think things are going great by way of, of what I wanted to accomplish and, and where we're at today, I was very, very pleased to see the Minister of Education and Doug Ford capitulate today and agree to open Ontario schools, even though they haven't met the metrics they wanted to meet in order to open schools. Uh, I think this is a, a welcome step in the right direction and, and definitely a success to, to our effort. That's number one. Number two, what I'd like to see next is I'd like to go back to work. That's it. It's time for Ontario to go back to work. And 
we cannot continue locking down 15 million people at home. We cannot continue locking down people whose livelihoods is dissipating between our, before our eyes. You know, I used to be a bankruptcy lawyer when I started out bankruptcy and commercial litigation. This is not just the restaurants and the small shops, Brian. Every business has about 30 to 50 trade creditors, small, other small businesses or big businesses that cater to it. And those businesses are also suffering because of the chain and the supply chain, right? They're not getting, whether it's the repair person or the accountant or the t-shirt company or the lender or the landlord, all of them are suffering. And we have an economic tsunami in front of us as well of, of bankruptcies and foreclosures. And we need to also account for the healthcare effects of unemployment and bankruptcy because there are healthcare effects to that as well. So we need to allow folks to go back to work. That's the next, that's what's next on the horizon. And I have faith that Premier Ford is now finally hearing us out there because he hasn't heard people before this. Now he is. And now the media is turning on him as well, not just in terms of are you doing enough by way of COVID or do you understand the disaster of the lockdown? And I would venture to say that Doug Ford will, will come around and will lift the lockdown in, in the near future. Roland Barber, sorry, <laughs> Baba. That's okay. Um, do you want to run as a progressive conservative in the next election? And do you think you'll be invited to run as a progressive conservative in the next election? I, again, so, so the premier told me that, uh, not, not me, but I understood that I'm not allowed. Uh, I will not be allowed to run as a conservative candidate. I am, I've always been um, a conservative volunteer, uh, conservative advocate. Uh, I, I come from the uh, fiscally conservative wing of the party, but I'm a socially uh, progressive. I'm, I'm very liberal on, on um, social issues. And, and I think that's where Canadians are essentially. We're a little bit right of center on the economy and, and foreign affairs, and we're a little bit left to center on, on um, social issues. And I think that's, that's a fine balance that our party has often struggled with. But frankly, I'm not concerned with politics right now. I'm concerned with human lives. And I am very, very encouraged that we're having this conversation that finally people are willing to consider what is on the other side of the equation. And I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I uh, told somebody the other day that I was gonna be interviewing you and they said, why would you wanna interview him? He's a QAnon believer. Do you believe in QAnon? No, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm, not, a, I'm not sure what that is, um, but I'm, I'm as, you you're know. Not a cons you're not a conspiracy theorist. It's the opposite. There is no conspiracy of any kind. All of that is nonsense. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what I think has happened. There was, there was a virus coming from China, a new virus that we've never seen before. That's already a sensational story that is of course sensationalized by the media. Then you have a very high, seemingly high case fatality rate because you have folks dying from COVID and you're not testing enough around to see that COVID is actually very prevalent. So you think that the rate of people that die from COVID is very, very high. And so people get rightfully scared. And so you have this new virus from China that we've never seen before, compounded by a very high case mortality rate. And obviously a narrative develops that we have to defend ourselves against COVID. I was one of the greatest proponents of lockdown in March and April. I wanted to go harder and sooner until I learned in, in May that Stanford came out and said, infections are 50 times cases for every, in the United States, for every person that is tested with COVID, another 50 people are walking with COVID. And instead of that being good, bad news, that was actually great news because that means that all the metrics we're worried about like death and hospitalization are 50 times lower. So we have this narrative developing that there's a new virus from China and it's very, very deadly and we all need to do our part. And that becomes mainstream narrative. That becomes the correct narrative. That becomes the politically correct narrative. And so this political correctness manifests itself into very strict adherence, whereby if you don't adhere to this political correctness, you will be subjected to cancel culture and you'll be canceled just like I was from the Progressive Conservative Party. And unfortunately, then you'll have a person like your friend that will immediately assume that I'm some sort of conspiracy believer instead of, you know, 
articulating what I think is a fairly fair proposition. No, what is happening here is there's political correctness, cancel culture, and unwillingness of people to admit that they were wrong. Public health and politicians are unwilling to admit that they were wrong about the first lockdown, and they're still unwilling to have a discussion about the question I'm asking. What about all the people that are dying from the lockdown? Don't they matter? Can't we talk about them? And can't we calculate them? Can't we deduce this number, understand some metrics, and compare that against COVID at large? Even that they're unwilling to do, and that is intellectual dishonesty, and they're being called on it. And it's only a matter of time, I think, until this house of cards fall apart, where we're comfortable saying that lockdown is deadlier than COVID. Roman Baber, the MPP York Center, who is talking about COVID-19, talking about some of the issues and talking about the lockdown and whether there's other issues that we need to be um, cognizant of as well. I'm not agree. I, I'm not sure if I agree with everything you've said, but sir, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Brian. We're going to take a break and come back with some uh, concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us.